In this third episode on the rapture, we're going to consider two more of the several reasons to conclude that it takes place before the tribulation. Now, last time we saw that the rapture is called the blessed hope in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and that the entire seven years of the tribulation is God's wrath, not just the last half. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, makes it clear that we are not appointed to God's wrath. A third reason to conclude that we ought to see the rapture coming before the tribulation is that we are told to pray for escape. Now, I must confess that I'm rather wary of those who mock the pre-tribulation position by saying that it's merely escapist, that we only believe because we don't want to be here for the tribulation. How can anyone who's read what the tribulation will be want to be there? If rejecting a pre-tribulation rapture because it's merely escapist is a valid objection, well, we could flip it and say with equal weight that people who believe in a post-tribulation rapture do so because they want it to be true. They want to be here for the tribulation. Now, of course, that's absurd. They believe the rapture comes after the tribulation because they think it best aligns with Scripture. Well, those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture ought to be accorded the same respect. We hold this position because we see the preponderance of biblical evidence supporting it, even regarding this issue of escape. We are told to pray that we might escape what's coming. In Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said this, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Now, the day that he means here is the day of the Lord, which begins with the rapture. He goes on, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And there's that phrase, earth dwellers, again, that we encountered back in episode one. It refers to those folk who are unrelentingly attached to the rebellious world system. We read on, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, compare what Jesus says in verse 36 with what he tells the Philadelphians in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. There we read, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Escaping the horrors of the tribulation is something Jesus told us to pray for. Note that Jesus promised the church at Philadelphia, not that he would keep them in or through the coming global trial, which would be the post-tribulation position. His promise was to keep them from the hour, that is, from the very time of that trial. And now we come to a fourth evidence for a pre-tribulation rapture. And this one requires some familiarity with the ancient Jewish wedding customs. It's something that Jesus alludes to in John 14, but it tends to be missed by modern readers. An important rule for proper Bible interpretation is to ask what the words in the message meant to the original audience. We simply cannot make the Bible mean whatever we want it to. The original authors meant to say something, not to say anything and everything. You know, if I write a letter to a friend, he's really not free to make my words mean whatever he wants them to. All communication would go nowhere if we treated it that way. No, when we talk and when we listen, our goal is to make sure that we understand what people are saying. And that's true of the Bible as well. God means something when he speaks. It's the task of the Bible student and especially the teacher of Scripture, to get at what that meaning is. Now, there may be many applications for the truth and the principles that we find in Scripture, but there's only one meaning, and that meaning will limit those interpretations or uh, those applications. So, what did the disciples hear? What did they understand Jesus to mean when in John 14 he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
And Jesus pointed to something well known to those original disciples who first heard these words. He spoke of a Jewish wedding ceremony. Once a man and a woman were betrothed, the man would return to his father's house to add on a new room. As it neared completion, he would send a friend to tell his betrothed that the time for the wedding was drawing near. She got ready by gathering attendance and preparing her gown. She didn't know the precise moment of his arrival, only the general time. It was part of the suspense and the romance of the event that she had to wait without knowing the exact hour of his arrival. But the groom was waiting on his father's inspection of the new room. He couldn't claim his bride until given approval. Well, finally the day came and the groom went forth to claim his bride. His friends went with him, blowing trumpets and shouting to let everyone know that the time for the wedding had come. When he arrived, uh, the groom and bride were wed. There was a feast, the wedding supper, after which the man took his bride into the new room that he had made, where they would stay sequestered for seven days. Then they emerged, and he presented her to the community as his beloved, sharing with him from then on in the life of the village. Now listen, that's the exact terminology that Jesus used in John 14. This is how the rapture will occur. We are betrothed to Christ. He's now gone to prepare our chamber. We don't know the day or the hour of his return, but we do know the times and the seasons because he sent his friends, the prophets, to describe them. When the Father tells him it's time, Jesus will come, accompanied by the voice of the archangel, a mighty shout, and the trump of God, just as the Jewish groom was accompanied by his friends making a ruckus. Then Jesus takes us to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we will be sequestered with him in heaven for the seven years of the tribulation. And when he comes again, emerging from heaven in glory, we come with him to rule and to reign for a thousand years. Now, a fifth reason to discern a pre-tribulation rapture is the outline that we find in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, we find this. John says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So a threefold division for the book of Revelation is given there. First, John was to write the things that he had seen. Now that's chapter 1, where John has a vision of Jesus in glory. The second division are the things which are. And that's chapters 2 and 3, Jesus' message to the seven churches. And then the third division, the things which will take place after this. That's chapters 4 through the end of the book, chapter 22. That phrase, after this, here in verse 19 of chapter 1, is the Greek metatauta, the same words that commence chapter 4. So after these things, that's chapters 2 and 3, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So, after the messages to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, John is taken up to heaven, and it's from that vantage point that he witnesses the terrors of the tribulation in the following chapters. Interesting that the word church is used 18 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, and then not once until the very end of the book. Chapters 6 through 19 describe the tribulation. The word church is absent because the church won't be on earth. It'll be in heaven, so chapters 4 and 5 describe it there, worshiping God. If the mid-tribulation rapture were correct, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 would have to be after chapter 11, and if the uh, post-tribulation view was correct, chapters 4 and 5 would have to be after chapter 19. Only a pre-tribulation rapture makes sense of the flow of the book of Revelation and follows the outline for the book that Jesus gave John in verse 19 of chapter 1. Now, as we end, let me be clear about something. If we only had one or two of these evidences for a pre-tribulation rapture, the doctrine would rest on shaky ground. There aren't just one or two. There are many. And we've already considered five of them, and there's more to come. You know, a lawyer hopes for 
some one piece of undeniable evidence to prove his case. In the absence of the proverbial smoking gun, what he does is assemble as much evidence as he can because he knows that a jury has to decide most cases, not on some smoking gun, but on what's called the preponderance of evidence. Those who object to a pre-tribulation rapture have to say that they are unconvinced by the preponderance of evidence. They refuse to see the whole, only the parts which they reject one at a time.